Our next panel is on the nanny state. Can labor outdo the Tories? Uh, chairing the panel is James Bickerton, director of the campaign against Corbynism. Is that on? Yeah. Perfect. I got quite a loud voice, I think. So the panel is the nanny state, can Labour outdo the Tories? So obviously we're going to be discussing, it's very possible in a week's time, well, in a month's time, it's plausible that there could be a Jeremy Corbyn-led government. What would that mean? And in terms of individual liberty um, in the kind of nanny state areas, how much difference would that make? Because obviously the current or the former Conservative government introduced things like um, the, the sugar tax or the sugar levy and um, lots of restrictions on cigarette displays, etc. So, so we've, got, we've got a great panel. So we've got Douglas Carswell, who was MP for Clacton, um, elected first as a Conservative, then I believe was the only UKIP MP ever to be elected at a general election, is that correct? Um, and then, of course, an independent, also the author of a number of books, including Progress versus Parasites, A Brief History of the Conflict That Shaped Our World. Uh, we've got Christopher Snowden, who I imagine will have quite a lot to say about this, who is the Head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute for Economic Affairs. He's also written a number of books, including Killjoys, a critique of paternalism. Um, we've got Lucy Harris, who is the Brexit Party MEP for Yorkshire and the Humber. Um, she founded Leavers of London, which is a kind of pro-Brexit campaign and social group. And that grew into Leavers of Britain, which became quite a kind of big national thing. And then obviously, you went into politics. Um, so I, I think we should start. Do you want to start with Douglas? Do, do you want to say, how, how kind of concerned are you about a Labour government in terms of the nanny state, do you think it'd be much worse than what we've got at the moment? I'm, I'm do, do I? Do I? I'm sorry. I can't. I kind of think it needed an introduction. Yeah, you got five to seven. Okay. Thank you very much for um, inviting me along to the Ayn Rand Centre, and um, I'm going to move on to answer that question in in in, in just a second. But I, I wanted to preface my comments. Um, with just a, a few observations as we're on the eve of what I think will be a, a very decisive election, decisive for all sorts of reasons. I've just came, come back from a week staying in, in New England in the old summer house of Milton Friedman. Milton and Rose Friedman have this beautiful little cottage that they built themselves. It's uh, on the uh, top of a very high mountain in Vermont. It looks out across the Connecticut River towards uh, New Hampshire. Uh, a, a, a state in America that famously has as its slogan, live free or die. And as, as, I, as I sat there in Milton Friedman's house, looking at the view that he looked at, a thought struck me. It must have seemed pretty grim at times for Milton Friedman. Those who believe in the fight for liberty must have had all sorts of cause for despair in the 1950s and the, and the 1960s. Half the world would have been run not just by socialists, but half the land surface of the world was controlled by communists. In academia at those times, free market liberal ideas were regarded as terribly fuddy-duddy and old-fashioned. Keynesianism was all the rage. We saw at that time governments around the world, including in Britain and to some extent in America, trying to engineer society and certainly engineer the economy. Things must have seemed at times pretty grim for those who believe in the free market and liberty. And yet, look at what Friedman and his generation achieved. Look at what they did to shift what we today call the Overton window away from nanny state, top-down state control, officials trying to manage people's lives for them. And look at what they did in terms of shifting the body politic in Britain, America, in Europe, and I would say around the world towards the cause of freedom and liberty. We've got to find ways of doing in this day and age what Friedman and Bob Chister and those other heroes did in an earlier generation. And we've not been doing it. And the price of not doing it is not just that we see a Labour government embracing a hard socialist agenda where they want to nationalise companies and, and control our lives. I think the real price we pay is what happens to those who should know better on the so-called centre-right of British politics and American politics. I would argue it's impossible to counter Corbynism when the alternative is a sort of George Osborne Tory party that wants to control the amount of sugar in your iron brew. 
I would say it's impossible to argue against Jeremy Corbyn's ideas of people's quantitative easing, helicopter money, when you had a supposedly free market Tory government for the past nine years handing out quantitative easing subsidies to rich bankers. I would say it's impossible to argue the case for liberty in a general election if you've allowed the Overton window to be shifted so far towards the interventionist left. I'm an optimist. I, I think this is a battle that, that we can win. But I think we should be absolutely unforgiving for those who, when it comes to an election, offer us tax cuts, who, when it comes to an election, bang the drum of liberty, but who have a record of micromanaging from the top down. Because of the cowardice of successive generations of conservatives, I would say ever since November 1990 in this country, when Thatcher fell, that's the real reason that we end up with a hard left Corbyn alternative. If people who should know better, Friedman used this wonderful phrase where he said that the, the, the mission in politics is for us to make sure that even the wrong people have to do the right thing. We all know that Corbyn and co are the wrong sort of people and they're definitely intent on doing the wrong thing. We need to focus on making sure that even the Sajid Javids and the Boris Johnsons and the Jacob Rees-Moggs and the Pretty Patels understand that they have to do much more for the cause of liberty. The price we pay for not doing so is not just controlling how much sugar in our Coca-Cola. If we concede that the state has a role in doing that, then there is literally no limit to what the state can do. It will reach into our children's classroom, into our wallet, into the fridge in our kitchen. Um, we're living with the consequences of a failure of 20, 30 years of uh, conservatives who are free market libertarians in name only. Um, I think we desperately need Freedmans. It's a great privilege to be on a panel with one or two of them. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'll try to pass down to Christopher, who I imagine has quite a lot to say on the subject. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Um, well, as I'm against the nanny state and I'm against socialism, it would be very neat and tidy if I could say that they are part and parcel of one another and that um, the further left a party is, the more likely they are to intervene in your personal lifestyle. Um, I'm not sure that's really the case, however. I edit something called the Nanny State Index, which compares the 28 EU countries with one another on uh, the, the, the basis of how they over-regulate smoking, vaping, uh, you know, diet, uh, alcohol, and so on. And Finland has always come up top. Finland is a pretty big welfare state, kind of social democracy, pretty left-wing, so that could uh, be used as evidence. However, right underneath it is Hungary, which is not especially left-wing, to put it mildly, uh, the UK, uh, Ireland, Lithuania, at the bottom of the index, the freest countries are places like Czech Republic and Luxembourg, Germany. There isn't really much of a, much of a pattern there. And if you look through history, you know, the, 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 the hardest left governments have not necessarily been nanny state. They've tried to control people's lives in all kinds of ways. Um, the communists actually got rid of alcohol prohibition. A lot of people don't know that there was full US-style alcohol prohibition in 1917, after, uh, 1917 when the Russian Revolution took place, and some historians have said it probably wouldn't have taken place had the population been more drunk. Um, but the, the, the Bolsheviks, after a few years, got rid of uh, prohibition of every form of alcohol. They were not particularly fussed about people Smoking, there wasn't a lot of obesity in the USSR or other communist countries, but that was more of an unintended consequence rather than a deliberate public health policy. Um, and if we look at Britain over the last 20 years, um, you know, Tony Blair uh, and Gordon Brown were better than David Cameron and it's certainly Theresa May. I mean, over that 13 year period of New Labour, yeah, you had the smoking ban that was deeply illiberal, but you also had. A relaxation of the drinking laws, you had a relaxation of the gambling laws. It's really only the smoking ban that is a big blot on their record in terms of nanny state activity. And that was then followed by David Cameron, who very quickly brought in the display ban for tobacco, the plain packaging for tobacco, the sugar tax. He wanted to bring in minimum unit pricing, was only overruled by elements of, uh, of his own party. So you would have to say that the Conservatives have a worse record on this um, in recent times 
than the Labour Party has. And if you look further afield, I don't know, Yaron's uh, already said that Trump is a socialist, but de dealing with shades of grey here, I mean, d Donald Trump is, uh, is in the process of clamping down on e-cigarettes. Putin is being far more anti-alcohol than any of his communist predecessors, and I, I wouldn't put <coughs> Putin down as being uh, a, a left-winger. Um, so I don't think there's that much of a, of a connection. So it's quite hard to say what Corbyn would do. There is actually an element of the hard left, which is really quite laid back about the working man having a drink, having a bet, having a smoke. Um, and I'm told that there are people within Corbyn's circle who, well, they didn't like Tom Watson for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons they didn't like him is he was trying to clamp down on you know, breakfast cereals and, and gambling and so on. And actually, uh, some of those people in the hard left don't actually like this stuff, They, for whatever reason. Um, you wouldn't call them libertarians, obviously, but um, it, it's, not, uh, it's not inevitable by any means that um, socialists want to control that part of uh, people's lives. Perhaps they've got bigger fish to fry with trying to control the economy. I think the key word here is not socialist, it's actually progressive. And uh, you might say that's splitting hairs. A lot of socialists now call themselves progressives, but they're always changing their names. You know, uh, they, uh, they call themselves liberals, and they're obviously the exact opposite of that. It's currently quite trendy for, for socialists to call themselves progressives. But someone like Owen Jones or Ash Sarkar, then they, they are socialists. They're pretty hard, you know, um, hardline socialists. Progressives, um, we don't have a history of the progressive movement in, in Britain. Um, it's worth reading up on the progressive movement in America. There's a very book, a good book called Illiberal Reformers came out a few years ago. I can't remember the name of the author, but um, it describes the progressive movement and their aims very well. To put it in simple terms, progressives, they are not really socialists. They're quite... They're quite comfortable with a large amount of um, state involvement in the in the economy, but they're not particularly interested in the state actually running the economy or nationalising industries. They they like trust busting, but they don't actually want the government to to run these businesses. Um, they are very technocratic. They believe essentially in creating a new world, in creating a new man, and using various forms of coercion to do that, uh, of taking lessons lessons from science and applying them in a very bureaucratic way. It's a very elitist project, really. Um, and it's, in some senses, well-meaning in that they want people's health to improve, for, for example. Um, but out of the progressive movement came prohibition in, in America. It was a, a classic example of a progressive policy. Very top-down, illiberal, designed to fundamentally change society so that a point would come when people wouldn't even want to drink alcohol. Eugenics also was a was a very big part of it, and of course the the the, the way eugenics kind of uh, came to a head in the 1940s in in Europe is one reason the kind of progressive ideas um, fell apart. So progressive ideas are fundamentally different to socialist ideas. They're both, you know, left wing certainly, uh, you know, to, to to people who are fans of Ayn Rand, um, but it is actually a different mentality, and I think that the Politicians who have got caught up in this nanny state stuff, they're buying into that progressive mentality, and it doesn't matter whether you're on left or right, uh, you, you, are, you are vulnerable to that. And finally, I would say that a lot of this, it, you, you can, as I hope I make clear, you can't really pigeonhole this left or right. Generally speaking, you're dealing with quite low-grade politicians. If I, I don't think we've ever had such a bad bunch of politicians many of whom hopefully will, will, will shortly be getting kicked out. Um, but, I mean, Tom Watson, to go back to him, he's a classic example. He's a gullible person. I don't think he's a very intelligent person. I don't think he's got many principles. Um, but he likes the idea of, of the big action, of, of fundamentally changing something, whether it's, it's something as trivial as clamping down on gamb gambling machines in, in bookies or getting Tony the Tiger off the, um, the pack of a um, box of Frosties. Um, and there are lots of people like him. James Riley in Ireland is a big nanny state guy. Nicola Roxon in, in Australia. Sarah Wollaston, Anna Subri, these people. You know, very low-grade people who don't have much of a vision, actually. Um, but they like the idea of the big statement, the big policy that gets their, gets their names out, out there. They feel that they're taking on vested interests, feel that they're taking on big corporations. And if we do end up I don't think we will, but if we do end up with a, a, a Corbyn government, insofar as they will be nanny state, I think it will be entirely framed 
in the rhetoric of taking on the big businesses. Corbyn's tweet when Tom Watson uh, retired uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, applauded him for taking on the big sugar companies. It's very difficult to tell whether this, whether this was deliberately damning with faint praise. You know, it seems so, such an absurd thing to compliment somebody on at the end of a long political career. But yeah, he took on the big sugar companies. Fantastic. Um, and... I'm not sure that they necessarily want to control people's eating and drinking habits, but they certainly don't like the idea that there are big businesses uh, ultimately behind these products. Um, yes, so by the sound of things, there are big concerns about the commitment to individual liberty amongst both, well, for both Labour and the Tories. Um, now, how about the Brexit Party? What can we expect from the new outfit? <laughs> what can we expect from the new outfit? Um, well, I mean, from we were basically voted in as MEPs in May, and I think the Brexit Party has gone some way in uncovering a lot of the bureaucracy and a lot of the strange goings on in the EU Parliament. Um, and I think from from my background, from Leavers of Britain, and looking at how uh, you know social conventions fit in with nanny statism, it slowly becomes something that from nanny statism, something a, a little bit darker. I think nanny statism is too kind. It suggests that the state means well. But I think what we're slowly seeing is that actually the state means to control. And I think we should get rid of the idea that it's a nanny. It's definitely not a nanny. It's a, it's a boss that's screaming down your neck every two seconds about every minutiae of your life. Um, so, you know, apart from both, you know, Tories and Labour introducing further regulation in the past few years, I think the real culprits of this outfit um, is the culture of quangoism and uh, the quangtocracy, <laughs> as I'm going to call it, um, within um, within our state, but also within the European Union. Um, and it's been introduced by Labour, so they've initiated this idea of ultimate control over every single money show of your life. And it's um, to be, uh, you know, supposed to be an impartial body, but they've made it completely partial. It politicizes the very people who control every element of your life. Um, and I am terrified to see uh, a Jeremy Corbyn government get control of those mechanisms that do control every part of your life, because it will always be tinted with an element uh, of socialism. And indeed, with a lot of the anti-Semitic stuff that's been coming out, if you believe that the Labour Party is fundamentally anti-Semitic and its whole structures are institutionally anti-Semitic, that will filter through into the very um, me mechanisms and cogs of how we uh, go in to make law in our civil service. Um, and I, I think we've seen a, a lot uh, in recent times of how the civil service does act in a very politically minded way. I think the case of Darren Grimes having to go against uh, some of the institutions um, that have basically dictated to him what is the correct way of going about his business. And then ultimately slapping a, a, a fine on him of, I think it was £20,000. Um basically when it, it had no jurisdiction to do that. It, why, why have we given so much power to these quangos? Um, and ultimately, their reason to be is to create more and more legislation. That's how they feel that they have control, power, and are able to implement, um, implement their idealistic world and their idealistic vision. Uh, and that's what they view as progress. Um, the EU itself is a perfect realisation of this uh, and that's what I've, I've come to see when, when I'm working in, in the EU Parliament. There's things that we vote on which don't really need voting on and I'll give, a, give you a few examples of, of that in a minute. Um, but how do, how do they get all this uh, through? How are they able to sell this to the general public? And I don't think it's through public approval. I think that they've basically given up on trying to find public approval for banning certain things, especially, I think it was, uh, was it porn that they were trying to ban recently? Um, they've given up on public approval, and they've now turned to public disapproval to get things through, uh, or looks like uh, public approval. Um, and together, that sort of, that quango, and together with public disapproval, they are able to create this atmosphere where people feel like they don't have control over anything, and if they speak out against it, 
then they're in a situation where they're on the back foot and their freedom of speech is quashed and their ability to get things uh, said and done in a way that they perceive the world should be is, is completely out of their control. Um, and that's underpinned by this, um, by the media and the institutions. Likewise, in, in sort of the Quango uh, sort of civil service, being ultimately partial and being ultimately leaning towards a certain political ideology, it means that there is um, a case for people with ordinary traditional views feeling like they can't speak out. Now, I started Leavers of Britain, which basically talks about, uh, which basically is a group of uh, people from across London. It started with 10 people who voted for Brexit within the London area who felt that they weren't getting a fair hearing. And I think this is indicative of also conservative-minded views. I think it's indicative of many views that aren't accepted by the wide, wider mainstream uh, opinion, that aren't accepted by uh, people within p positions of power. And we had 10 people show up for the first event. We now have over 4,000 signed up members in London alone. And I think that tells you that there is a desire for ordinary people to actually talk about uh, things that are happening to them uh, on their, in their daily lives. You know, they want to go down to the pub without feeling this public disapproval, this, um, this inability to talk about what's on their mind. Um, and it's part, of, uh, it's part of this idea of social ostracization, this ability that if you don't think exactly the way we do, you're going to be left out of the discussion. You're not going to be able to play a part in society at large. Um, and I think this is very much the way that they get around having their, their sort of uh, world of view pushed and forced upon the ordinary members of the public through uh, the mechanisms being fundamentally partial and then also having uh, a widespread public disapproval pushed by the media and pushed by other institutions within society. Um, and I think one of the things that really, um, w really stood out for me, and there's a book that I often read um, and I often sort of refer back to when I'm thinking about what we're currently facing, and that's The Road to Wigan Pier by um, George Orwell. And it's basically um, George Orwell is describing, uh, you know, um, the miners and how they're confronting this, uh, the social, the middle class social, um, socialist mentality from, from their middle class partners. And it's, you know, it's exactly as, you know, it's been said in the book. Um, I'll read out some, some, uh, so a few, um, a few passages which I think really hit home. And it's about suppressing that uh, traditional viewpoint. It's about suppressing people's opinions. It's about suppressing uh, what you actually want to talk about to move on from, uh, to, to progress through into a different uh, situation where the quangos and basically people who have a very particular viewpoint are. So um, on the working class and the middle class, you know, what is the attitude that they give up? Uh, what they, they give out. What is this attitude? An attitude of sniggering superiority punctuated by bursts of vicious hatred. You will find it everywhere, taken for granted that a working class person as such is a figure of fun except at odd moments when he shows too many signs of being too prosperous. Whereupon he ceases to be a figure of fun and becomes a demon. And it goes on to say that his habits and traditions are then sort of mocked within the public eye. And I feel that that's what a lot of people currently are feeling. They feel that they can't openly talk about things that they hold dear, things that they hold to be the reality of life, and things that they seem are um, basic social conventions. There is a suppression of people to speak freely, and I think that's ultimately uh, a way for the nanny state and a way for the general, uh, the way for people in power to suppress ordinary people's feelings and minds. Yeah, no, thanks. Very interesting. Um, and now, as, as an American, uh, how, <laughs> how kind of concerned is the freedom-loving movement in America about the prospect of a Corbyn government in Britain? I, I've got a mic, so oh, I, um, <laughs> I, I'll just, just, just one little comment, just a, a slight disagreement. I, I wouldn't call them bosses. You can resign <laughs> if you're a boss. They're frigging tyrants. Um, okay. They're little dictators. They're not, bosses is way too good of a term. It's better than a nanny, right? I mean, you want to have bosses in a world. 
You need bosses in the world. We're not Marxists, right? We, we believe bosses have a role, but, but they are dictators, they're tyrants. Now, how, how upset is the United States about Corbyn? I mean, we've got our own problems. <laughs> And we're struggling with them. So uh, I think people are worried because they see it as a, as a much bigger trend. Um, I think one of the things you've seen in the UK is a, is a dramatic shift to, to a, more, a more extreme left. But you've seen the same thing in the United States. I mean, Elizabeth Warren, talk about a nanny, uh, a dictator, uh, is, is the leading candidate right now in the Democratic Party, something that I think was unthinkable uh, you know, a couple of years ago, that, that the Democratic Party would shift that far to the left. Of course, the moderate in the Democratic Party, the guy who's going to save the party right now, is Mayor Bloomberg, right, who famously wanted to ban uh, soda if it was beyond a certain, you know, size. So this idea of a, of a nanny state is, is it dominates both political parties. It dominates left and right. Uh, you know, and, and it's inevitable, uh, you know, and particularly inevitable in the UK. I mean, I mean, I'm shocked that it took you so long to have a sugar tax, and I'm, I don't know where the fat tax is. I mean, that's, that's coming, I guess, although now fat is good, I guess, uh, later science says. Because once you nationalize health care, then uh, that's the ultimate nanny state. There is no bigger nanny than nanny state or dictator state or, uh, than, than, than the NHS. The NHS is basically... Uh, the ultimate in, in dictating. And then once we, we've socialized the provision of health care, then I care about what you eat because I'm paying for your unhealthy habits. I care about how you behave because I'm paying for your unhealthy habits. One of the reasons that we fight so hard in the United States to prevent the socialization of medicine, there are lots of reasons, but one of them is because as long as you're paying your own health care bill, then it's your business how much you drink and how much you smoke and how much what you eat and how much sugar you consume because you get to pay for it. You get to suffer the consequences of bad behavior. Once you nationalize it at all, we all start caring. And it's very, very, very dangerous. One of the, you know, one of the last little bastions of this kind of freedom in the U.S. is the fact that we, some of us, a certain percentage of the population can still buy private health insurance. Not if you're over 65. That, there we believe in socialism completely. It's under 65 we believe in a little bit of, 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 of uh, freedom. But I think what's important here is to, is to think about what unites the left and right in their belief that they should dictate our lives, that they should run our lives for us, that they could, they could be dictators over different aspects of our lives. And you're seeing this both on the left and the right and, and you're seeing it, unfortunately, in the population at large, and this is why they elect these people, is a, a distrust of the individual's capacity to take care of himself, a distrust of, individual, uh, of the individual to live his life in pursuit of his own happiness, independent of, of regulation, controls, and manipulation by, by the society as, as channeled through the state. Uh, it's a distrust of individual human reason, individual ability to live and to take care of oneself. Uh, and, and this has always been the excuse of why we regulate, because I don't think you can separate nanny state issues from business regulation. I think they're very much related, right? They tell us what toys we can buy because some toys might be too dangerous and, and we as parents are too stupid to know what toys are good and what's not. And the market would not determine what, good, what toys are good and what's not. So we need a state regulatory agency to ban certain things and to regulate. And we need, we need public education. Well, here it's the reverse. We need government education because God forbid you leave parents alone to decide what education their kids go get. They can make decisions for themselves we need to dictate that every kid gets an education and we need to provide the education because parents can't be trusted to do it themselves. They would, they would send their kids off to work in the factory if they had that option or they would, they they would send them to the worst kind of schools possible if, if, if they had those kind of options. So God forbid we have school choice or any kind of choice like that. All of these things, all of the business regulations, the educational regulation, the healthcare regulation, are all a form of the state the progressives, the, and I, I agree with Christopher about the history of the progressive movement, particularly in the United States, really pushed this. And of course, the Republicans embraced progressivism 
early with Teddy Roosevelt and, and there was a whole progressive wing of the Republican Party in those days and the left embraced him too with, with, uh, with Wilson. So progressivism is, is part of American political culture. But it's, it's the idea that we as individuals need, cannot live cannot use our reason to, to, to pursue our own values. Our values are corrupt. As individuals, we're corrupt, and we need society to help us take care of ourselves, whether in the material world or in the spiritual world, whether in the economic realm or the day-to-day -day kind of decision-making realm. In every single realm, we need the state's help. We can't negotiate our own salaries. No, you're going to be underpaid. So we need the state to provide a minimum wage and benefits. You know, we have to tell the employer what benefits we get and what we don't get. We can't negotiate that ourselves because you can't trust the individual to actually provide for himself. Who are you as an individual to live for yourself? Ultimately, you are just a cog in some collectivistic machine. And this is all driven by different forms from the right and from the left of collectivism. So I want to go back to what... Uh, Douglas said, it's what we need to fight for consistently in every aspect of our lives is for the rights of individuals to live their lives free of coercion, free of force, free of people dictating to them what they can and cannot do, free of authorities that tell us how we should and shouldn't live. And if we don't live by their standards, we get penalized by force. What we need to do is throughout, from the economic realm, the social realm, every realm of life, fight for liberty, fight for individual liberty, individual freedom, and fight for individualism, the sanctity of the individual. And, and so it's, it's too many of our, of our free market fellows, you know, fight the fight in economics. And even there, they compromise way too much and ignore the social side. And then the people specialize, but it's all one fight. There's one fight, and that is for individual freedom, for the individual mind, for the individual ability and right to make their own. And it, the two are connected. If they don't have the ability, you're never going to have the right. You have the ability and the right to make decisions for yourself. You might make lousy decisions. You might fail in life. That's on you. That's on your decision. So you have to fight for free will, for reason and for individual rights consistently throughout every aspect of human life. And until we're willing to fight consistently about that, we continue to lose no matter who's you know, in, in power. Um, now, I think we've got time for some questions. Um, if we could take in batches of two or three, just to kind of keep, keep things going. Um, should I run out of the microphone? Probably the easiest way. Thanks. Just, just a quick one. Because the Conservative Party, as I say, has given up a lot of the moral um, ground on things. Out. When the debate comes about spending, you can always point to, to Conservative spending plans, which kind of take the um, argument away from them then fighting against an excessive labour-based spending plans, because they're both spending plans. Um, a thought that occurred to me, and thanks for the inspiration from the Brexit candidates, uh, sorry, Brexit MEP, apologies, um, would it work if the current rise of Brexit-minded individuals, um, you mentioned the London, the Leave for Britain? Yep, um, society and people like that. With this current election, <coughs> would it actually work if they went in a Tea Party-like rush into the modern Conservative Party and changed it from inside? Uh, brief one to um, John Brooke. Uh, do you think anti-Semitism is on the rise today? And where is it going if this is happening? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask what you thought would be the best way to, to take this fight to the world. Um, there are some different avenues, politics, media, academia. Where do you think the people in this room should put their efforts? How many are we taking? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Hello everyone, I'm an architect in UK and we are subjected to a lot of uh, building regulations. So I like to believe that our um, 
uh, job is more inherently capitalistic and individualistic, but these regulations are not allowing to do that, unfortunately, and it's absolutely frustrating. For example, there's one rule where if you own a property, you can't even build even one meter extension without asking your neighbor's permission, the council's permission, and so on and so forth. So what are your opinions about this, and how do we stop this madness? I'm sorry, how do we stop this? <laughs> Um, well, that's probably enough for uh, a bit. Um, yeah, so we'll start with Lucy, because uh, one of the questions very specifically aimed at you. So, can the Brexit Party complete a kind of Tea Party like takeover of the Conservative Party? Is that the problem? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, can it happen? Well, who says it's not already happening? I mean, we have um, a lot of really sound people who are now in you know, the mechanics of the Tory party. Um, and I think there's a lot of people with, within um, the Tory party that have got individualism and have got the basic structure of the prophecies that small C conservatism has had and uh, for, for some time. I think that all in all, the general pub, the the general political scene hasn't really been relating back to its own philosophies for a really long time and have been concentrating on this uh, over-regulated, you know, control mentality, whereas they never refer back to the reasons why they exist in the first place, why do the Conservatives exist in the first place. And I think now that we have people who are, uh, you know, fundamentally educated in philosophy and who have that at the back of their mind continuously working within the Tory party, I'm hoping, I am hoping to see a change. Um, can can it you know can there be a modern day Tea Party? I think a lot of people right now are sh slowly shifting back to whether they're Tory, whether Labour, you know, parties like mine uh, are seeing you know a drop in the polls, and I think people are realigning and, and reasserting themselves in their original homes. So yeah, I think it's possible. Yeah, that's great. Um, so Douglas, I think it's the third or fourth question. Um, if you want to fight for liberty right now, what should you do? It's tempting to think that the answer to it is through politics. Um, and certainly there are people in politics who, who support we need to affect change. And change isn't going to happen unless it manifests itself ultimately in a change in the body politic. But politics is not enough. Politics is never going to be enough. Don't ever take comfort from the fact that Sajid Javid says he admires Ayn Rand. <laughs> because he may have read The Fountainhead, but... It's the civil servants around him who encase him in this bureaucracy of limited possibilities for change that are going to really drive him. So the question is, what do we do? Yes, by all means, look to politics, but it's not politics that's going to drive change. The fundamental cause of the problem isn't even, as Lucy brilliantly described, the Quango state with its insistence upon doing things by top-down design. The fundamental cause of the problem, I believe, is a corruption in the social sciences. People in social sciences, particularly that corrupted and degenerate subject, economics, believe that it is possible to gather in one place enough information to know enough about outcomes to order human economic and social affairs by design. In the past, in the pre-enlightenment era, there were religious creeds and doctrines which told, rather conveniently for the priesthood of elites, whether they were pharaohs or, or, or medieval princelings, that they knew enough to be able to order the world by, by design. And we see this same conceit post-enlightenment manifesting itself in all sorts of ways. Scientism, communism, environmentalism, Europeanism, all of them are basically post-enlightenment creeds that say that a small enlightened priesthood who know enough can order our lives for us. And this invidious notion is so pervasive now in academia. It pervades almost all the social sciences. If we want to counter it, we need to recognize that it's based on not true empiricism, but on what David Deutsch, the famous philosopher and physicist, calls inductivism. And economics and sociology and pretty much everything that you find in a PPE degree at an Oxbridge University now is basically an inductivist um, training of the mind rather than a proper education. And we need to tackle that if we are to affect real change. But I, I sense that there is a crisis coming in academia. Um, you can only go woke so far. You can only pile on so much debt in the universities before you start to realize you're producing 
third-rate degrees for third-rate minds taught by third-rate academics. When that crunch moment comes, I think there will be ripe opportunities for universities like Buckingham with two-year degrees to come in with proper, genuinely empirical um, academic degrees that are, are profoundly different and game-changing to what we've had mainstream academ uh, universities produce for the past 20 or 30 years. Um, great. If I could pass down to you. So, there are kind of two things that particularly struck me. So, first of all, obviously, we've had this debate about anti Semitism, um, and it's extraordinary the extent to which it's become an issue in the UK with the, the Jewish Chronicle, the biggest British Jewish newspaper, kind of urging non Jews <laughs> not to vote. Um, so, the first thing is obviously, you've explained why you think that's an issue on the left, but why do you think it's become an issue so specifically in Britain? And second of all, how, how do you think that um, advocates of you know, freedom and individ individualism should um, organise and work in the UK? I mean, yeah, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. For, for, you know, I, I don't know enough about the UK to know why it's specifically here. It's always been around in the Marxist left. There's always been uh, anti-Semitism. As I read, you know, I read an extensive quote from Karl Marx himself. He was a, quite an anti-Semite in spite of Jew being Jewish himself. He was very anti-Semitic and, and linked Judaism with capitalism. And I think that is why the left so resents uh, Judaism. I Israel, I think, is another source of anti-Semitism in more recent times, particularly here in the UK. You see that everywhere. And again, I think that's connected to the whole, the success of Israel, the fact that Israel is such a, has become such a powerful state. Uh, and and people, people resent, particularly on the left, people resent success. They resent achievement. They resent wealth. And Israel's become wealthy. So, uh, I think those are the two things that come to mind in terms of why it happens here, but you're seeing it all over. I mean, it's certainly um, within the Democratic Party in the United States, you're seeing the same kind of phenomena of elements within the Democratic Party that are quite anti-Semitic, and you're seeing it on the radical right, in, in, on the extreme right in the United States. Uh, people, the anti-immigration, uh, you know, the people who are anti-immigration very much affiliate that immigration with Jews. Um, you know, the, if you remember Charlottesville, uh, when they had the torches and they were walking around, the, 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 the thing they were chanting, one of the things, blood and soil was one, uh, with a direct reference, right? And the second one was, Jews will not replace us. So I think in times of angst, I think in times of uncertainty, in times of where people uh, are struggling to make sense of the world, I think anti-Semitism rises in times of, uh, like that, and I think you're experiencing that in, in the UK for a variety of reasons, and you're certainly experiencing that very much so uh, in, um, in the United States. Um, I, I, just two things on the previous questions. I'd be very weary of using the Tea Party as a good example, of something good as an example, because what they've done to the Republican Party, initially we all thought was good, it's turned out to be a disaster. And, and they turned out to be just as bad in terms of wanting to control people's lives uh, in, in many respects as, as, uh, as whatever happened before then. Uh, and I would just add to what Douglas just said, I agree completely, this is about education, 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 and the bastions of education are universities, and that's where the real battle is being fought every single day, and we're losing, right? So, so that, that, is, that is certainly part of the problem. And it does go back to a very fundamental battle that, 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 is, that is waged, and that is the battle between the Enlightenment and everybody else. Uh, the Enlightenment is the era of individual liberty. It's, it's a philosophical era that advances individual liberty because it recognizes reason as man's means of, 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 of living and survival. And by raising reason up, by, and, and science and reason, and the idea that you are competent enough to choose your own path in life, they liberate, literally liberate the individual. And it, a lot of what's happening in academia today, the, a lot of the central planning, is really going back, hearkening back to Plato, right? It's, these are philosopher kings. The idea of truth is in another dimension, whether it's a, uh, an identity dimension in the United States with identity politics, or whether it's, it's some other dimension, whether it's religious or secular, and only the philosopher kings can commune with the world of spirits and tell us how to live. It goes back to Plato's Republic. And all anti-enlightenment ideas are in, in very much a platonic ideas. And in that sense, 
it's all a battle between Aristotle and Plato. And, and uh, unless we embrace the Enlightenment ideas, the ideas of individualism and the ideas of reason and the ideas of pursuit of happiness, we lose. These are, these are deeply philosophical issues. That, and, and this is why politics is a reflection of the philosophy adopted by people uh, at, 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 a, at, a, at an implicit level without them even knowing it. Um, and Chris, very similar question. So, I mean, how can advocates of freedom organise in the UK? And slightly more specifically, one issue where perhaps the Labour Party is doing more than conservatives is with certain drug policy. Um, so cannabis is, is an issue which I think is going to come up quite a bit. We haven't seen their manifestos yet. But it's quite plausible that Labour will call um, a, a royal review or, or possibly go all out and legalise. If that's the case, could you argue the Labour Party is doing more for individual freedom than the Conservatives in the nanny state sense? Uh, yes, but as I said before, I mean, why would that be particularly surprising? I mean, what, what, is the, what have the Tories done in the last nine years to make you think it would be otherwise? Um, I don't know what they will do in regards to that issue. Political parties tend to steer clear of it. Um, I think if if any Conservative Prime Minister is going to legalise cannabis, I think it would be Boris Johnson. I'm fairly optimistic about <laughs> Boris Johnson, actually. I don't know, he banned drinking on the tube before someone mentions it. Uh, but, I mean, the guy is, if not a libertarian, a libertine himself. And I, I think <laughs> some of that will hopefully shine through. In terms of what people can do to, to fight this fight, I mean, ideally, go into the civil service or politics or at least academia. Um, if it's too late in the day, for that to happen, then you know, take to social media, ring up the Jeremy Vine show, you know, and 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 oppose oppose everything, you know, oppose <laughs> everything because there's there's these people never act in good faith, even if they've got an idea that sounds relatively benign, it will be designed to open the door to a whole slew of regulation, and you don't need to oppose it on kind of arcane philosophical grounds either. There are perfectly sensible. Um, you know, un uh, comprehensible reasons to oppose this stuff on economic grounds. This stuff doesn't work. It's nearly always based on, on junk science. Um, and it, it can be opposed, you know, because although there's kind of quite broad support for this kind of stuff in Parliament, it's pretty shallow. And if politicians have any feeling, feeling that there is, it might lose them any votes, then they, they simply won't go ahead with it. This is an optional add-on for a lot of politicians. It is not at the core of their being. It is not why they got into politics. Um, it might give them a few headlines and it, it puts something on the CV, but they're not that bothered about things. There's no way David Cameron was cared either way about plain packaging. He just made the mistake of launching a public consultation and then left him in a position where he kind of had to do it for political reasons. It was not something that he, he, he became prime minister to do. So most of this stuff, people will drop if they feel there's any real opposition. The trouble is, the people who are proposing it, they are not, there is not a grassroots nanny state movement in this country. It hasn't really been since the time of the temperance movement. Um, it is a bunch of what's quangos, you know, it's, it's what were you saying? It's, it's, they are state funded organizations who exist to, to continue this mission creep. Um, but politicians can just ignore them. And if politicians ignore them, then they shut up. They, it's simple as that. They shut up. You know, the, 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 the public health lobby on minimum pricing, for example, they got a fair hearing in Scotland because the SNP wanted a big, bold policy, something they can actually do, which didn't depend on, on Westminster. In the UK, Gordon Brown. Um, made it very clear he wasn't going to do it. The Conservatives eventually made it very clear they're not going to do it. And there isn't an ongoing campaign. You don't hear people banging on every week about minimum pricing because they realise it's not going to happen. They only bang on the door if they think it's going to open. So if politicians just stonewall them, they just go away. It really is as simple as that. You just got to treat these people like, you know, uh, like <laughs> you know, unruly children. And you give them a bit of discipline and they don't do it again. <laughs> Can... Can I answer where do we take the fight first? Yeah, um, well, that's kind of why I, I set up what I set up. Um, I greatly believe that social ostracization is a great tool for people who do want to oppress people's freedom of speech. Um, and being able to talk freely means that we can actually reason, like, um, like we said was the initial, uh, the initial step of being able to be a free individual in control of your own future. So being able to talk freely is really important. And I feel that because we've been under such... Um, pressure from, you know, 
from, from the state and having everything decided for us, we've forgotten how to debate. And I think that Brexit was a political renaissance where people actually woke up and decided, actually, no, we, we, we do have a say in this. We can actually manipulate where our, our country is going. It's not going to be the same old thing every day, in and out, basically trying to uh, c control us under what the visions of the two main politicians, uh, political parties have in mind. So the ability to reason and the ability to talk about opinions openly, to be able to make mistakes and to be able to, like blind people, sort of, you know, feel our through, uh, ourselves through uh, difficult political topics is really essential. So I'd say like for ordinary people, the things that you can do is look at how you debate and be, and give people the benefit of the doubt in your conversations when you're talking about politics but also have an element of goodwill when you're talking to somebody who is not necessarily on your political wavelength. <clears throat> and it helps those to articulate themselves. It helps those for you to sort of fumble your way through to the truth. Um, and, of course, don't apply a social stereotype to a political opinion. As soon as you do that, you're falling into the trap that many Remainers did, which was, if you are a Brexiteer, you must be stupid and racist. And as soon as you do that, you're upping the social ostracization, and you're making people feel that they can't be open and fluent and try and get to the truth that they want to actually get to develop our country and our politics as you know something that's actually beneficial to our country and have that reason. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, should we take two questions this time, please? Thanks. Hello. Um, I've met you before, Lucy, so I've got a Brexit-type question. And my question is, as we all know, in, in England, it's really realigned politics, so that you will have, um, you know, a kind of conservative gentleman who I met who was talking about communists saying, OK, comrade, on we go. So we've, you know, sort of, you know, quite often in the Leavers meetings, there's a lot of communists, although mainly conservative. What my question is, and I know in a way that you won't be able to answer it, or anybody really, nor can I, is philosophically, you would just mention something you said that with the coming election, you thought that the parties, the Tories and Labour, were sort of going back into their normal places. Do you think Brexit is ever going to really end? <laughs> Hi, hi. My question is to Christopher. I would like to know a bit more about the nanny state index, if you could explain what goes in and what is left out, because in my mind, whether um, a company is regulated on how much sugar it can put or what price it can put on sugar is the same thing to uh, another company not being allowed to sell a specific type of financial product or uh, having a set price on loans. So where do you draw the line in assessing how big the nanny state is in the index? Yes, I think Chris Fabi, logical place to start. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we, we look at specifically e-cigarettes, tobacco, food, soft drinks, and alcohol. Um, so the, the traditional nanny states issues. We would like to include uh, gambling, but it's, it's for... Um, kind of data reasons, it's, it's rather complex. And there is a case for putting things like sex work and drugs in there as well. But to be honest, I mean, there isn't much variation actually across Europe and how, how governments regulate those two things. Um, so yeah, we stick to the, the traditional, what people I think normally think of as nanny state issues as opposed to, you know, broader regulation. You can check out the index, it's I think nannystateindex.org and you can, you can see uh, who ranks where. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so this was kind of aimed at Lucy, but I'll direct it to someone to Douglas. Will Brexit ever end? The short answer to the question is, yeah, yes, I think it will. I think it will end, um, fingers crossed, at the end of January when we leave the EU. Um, but I think your question alludes to a broader issue. I think what Brexit has done has exposed the extent to which there is a smug, self-regarding elite who preside over public policy formation, who tell us what is and what isn't acceptable. And I think we've woken up to the fact that this country is run by these charlatans. And I don't think the sort of suburban, Clactonian people that I used to represent in Essex 
are going to doff their caps to that any longer. I think they realized that the country is run by charlatans. People who preside over central banks with the same stupidity with which they said Project Fear would be unleashed if we voted to leave. Again and again and again, whether it's central banks, whether it's the people who decide what goes in the national curriculum, whether it's the people who preside over uh, our national health service, these people are basically morons, and they are routinely wrong. Um, it's hemorrhaging confidence in the political establishment. And the political establishment talks about this as though this is a bad thing. It is a thoroughly good thing that people realize that, like in The Wizard of Oz, when you draw back the curtain, these all-powerful people are confused middle-aged men who don't know what they're doing. And when people wake up to that, I think we will look back and see Brexit as the beginning of a fundamental change, a transformation between the governed and the governing. If I could just finish. When I was growing up, there were four TV channels, and a distant programmer would decide what we watched on a Saturday night. Paul Gambaccini was a famous DJ. He would decide what music you listened to on Radio 1. Radio 1, because there were four or five channels. When Classic FM came along, and you could have 24-hour classical music, it was considered radical and revolutionary. Today, people are growing up. They can listen to what they want, watch what they want. The idea that we need people like those distant programmers, like those distant DJs, deciding what we should have and what we shouldn't have, those days are coming to an end. And I think Brexit has stirred something very deep in the, in the English psyche. This, this effect incompetent elite, you know, these, these, I would call them the sort of the George Osborne generation of politicians. They need to get out. They need to go. And we need far-reaching and fundamental change. Never again should, if I could just put it this way, sorry to eat into your time. I think this country has been saved in the past century on three historic occasions by ordinary working people, by ordinary folk, against the stupidity and the folly of their elites. It was the elites in this country who in 1940, 1941, wanted to cut a deal with Germany. The only reason this country didn't do that is because when Winston Churchill said we're not going to do it, working people backed him. That's what rescued this country. All the posh people, all the Tory party grandees, all the people in the Carlton Club were on the side of appeasement. 1979, the same thing happened. All the elite said we needed a prices and incomes policy. We needed more Keynesianism. It was a grocer's daughter from Grantham, backed by the working class. She never once lost an election because she had majority working class support, who saved this country from the stupidity of academic socialists. And then again, June 2016, this country was saved from the folly of its elites, from the folly of its oligarchs, from the folly of its poshos, from the folly of its academics, by ordinary working people <coughs> full time on the EU. And you know, we need to put suburban people back in control of their lives and drive out the parasitic elite who've run this country and done a pretty good job at times of almost running it into the ditch. Yeah, so um, if there is a revolt against the elites, both in the UK or Brexit, and perhaps in America with Trump or Bernie Sanders, do you think that's a good thing for individual liberty or a bad thing? Well, the problem is it's, it's a revolt against something, but what is it for? And in the United States, you're saying what it's for. It's for a different type of statism and irrationality in the form of Trump. So I, I certainly don't think Trump is a move towards liberty. I don't think Trump is a move towards individual freedom. I think Trump is a move just towards a different type of collectivism, statism, and, and state regulation of our behavior, just on different fronts. And it is a, it is a red light for a lot of... Uh, it's a green light, so it's a green light for a lot of different type of tribalists and collectivists uh, to dominate the dialogue. But there's no discussion in America, left or right, in terms of individual liberty and individual freedom or, or, or really rolling back the state in any way. Uh, Donald Trump is spending, I mean, the, the spending of the Republican Party under Donald Trump it mimics, uh, mimics Obama. And you can cut taxes all you want, but what matters is spending because one way or the other, you're sucking money out of the private economy, whether it's through taxes or through debt, doesn't really matter that much. Focus always on spending, not on taxes. If you want to do anything to taxes, simplify them. But reducing taxes for the sake of reducing taxes, if you don't touch spending, is meaningless in the long run. 
So there's nothing that Donald Trump has done, with the exception of some reduction of regulations at the agency level, that has moved the United States uh, forward. And of course, if Bernie Sanders gets elected, you know, it's 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 much worse. Uh, although I think he would get very little done because I don't think anybody likes Bernie Sanders in politics. So I don't think he'd achieve anything. Elizabeth Warren is what scares me because she's Bernie Sanders with brains, um, and and uh, and and I think is competent, and that's that's really scary. But there's no nobody in American political world right now, nobody, who is advocating for freedom. Uh, the, the Tea Party has gone, it's disappeared, it's completely diffused itself. It's basically become a Trump party, a statist, collectivist party. Uh, but I think, and I look at Britain, and, and you guys look so much healthier than we are. I mean, truly. Uh, we are, I mean, I mean, we're building walls, we're, we're doing nutty things, in my view, um, instead of actually focusing on the problems that we have. And we're, we're left and right have bought into the same rhetoric, the rhetoric of inequality, the rhetoric of the, of, the, of the lost middle class, which is complete garbage and complete nonsense, just untrue. Um, and both from an economic perspective and from the perspective of nanny state, I, I don't see a difference between the left and the right in the United States today. Um, and, and, you know, I think abortion rights are, in, uh, are, are, are going to really, are really under threat in the U.S., on a massive scale, you're seeing state after state reduce uh, those rights. Yes, we're seeing marijuana, so so you'll be able to smoke, but you won't be able to have an abortion. And and it, in 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 many other respects, you're seeing yeah they, they choose they pick and choose, but they want to regulate our individual lives in one way or another. And of course, Republicans are very much against uh, marijuana. Certainly, uh, the Justice Department in the U.S. is so. I have very little optimism in the U.S., and I hope you guys take a much more positive path. And, of course, with Brexit, I think what, I'll just say this, I think what's interesting about Brexit is not Brexit. It's what you do with it, right? You are, you know, you, it's very possible you completely screw it up. <laughs> and that would be a tragedy, because there's certain elements of the European Union that are good. And, and you have to recognize that. And unless you're really committed to free trade and, and free movement of capital, free movement ultimately to some extent of people, then you're going to mess it up. And it's, it's, so it's, it's going to be really interesting and fun to watch. But I'm much more optimistic about what you can do here in Britain than what we're experiencing in the U.S. right now. Yeah, and finally, Lucy, so was that lady's question was originally in <laughs> Lucy. Um, so again, um, is Brexit kind of symbolic <laughs> of a, a large shift in our politics? And also, is the Brexit party got a future beyond Brexit? Oh, is, is that okay? I see what you're doing here. Okay. Um, so, you know, like, is Brexit ever going to end? And I think it depends how you see Brexit. If you see it as the chaos that um, a lot of our media outlets want us to see it, then, you know, it's going to end hopefully in January. Um, but for me, you know, Brexit, I really do hope it ends. I'm an MEP for the Brexit party and I, I really want my job to end. So I really hope it ends very soon. Because for me, Brexit isn't just about the very fact we're changing, but we're leaving the European Union. For me, it's the whole process. It's It's changing the country itself, you know, actually holding a light to those, uh, to those quangos. It's holding a light into the dark places of how our country is run and actually putting the voice of the general public back into our politics. Um, so I think that Brexit is a, a much, is a journey. It's going to be here for, for a long time. If, if I have anything to do with it, I want it to be the light of people's voices that was in the, the Brexit uh, the Brexit conclusion was I, I want to see it there continuing, continuing to the future of um, of this country. Um, so for me, no Brexit isn't going to end because for me Brexit is a very positive thing, thing, and it means fundamental change throughout our institutions. Um, what's the future for the Brexit party? I'll give you that one. Um, uh, you're probably looking for something to write about, <laughs> um, but. Um, it was a future for the Brexit Party. Well, you know, we are a one currently. We have a few policies out there, but we have, um, you know, the Brexit Party is called the Brexit Party, um, and I think the people within the Brexit Party also want to see continuous change within the system. 
Um, so I think it's not so much what happens to the Brexit party, but what happens to the sense of Brexit within our own politics and the politicians that have become Brexit party MEPs and maybe or maybe not Brexit party MPs. And I think it's holding the light uh, and continuing to hold the light um, to see whether Brexit is truly a Brexit to hold Boris Johnson to his, um, to his promises. I'm not sure we will be able to do that fundamentally going forward in the same way that we were doing. However, I definitely feel that as individuals of the Brexit party, we can definitely have more of a voice that shines light on whether Boris Johnson is going to fulfill the, his Brexit promises. So yeah, that's where it's going to go. It's going to be spokespeople from the Brexit party highlighting what he's doing or doing wrong. Yeah, um, no, thank you very much for some wonderful questions. Thank you to our brilliant panel. Um, I think it's a break now, is that that's right? How, how long is the break? Yeah, for? yeah. So uh, we're slightly behind schedule, so we're going to cut the break to about 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> during that break, Yaron Brook will be signing copies of a new textbook of Americanism, which you can purchase here for £10. Uh, we have some of Ayn Rand's books for £5, and we also have... What Justice Demands, America and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, I really recommend this book. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you in, in uh, 15 minutes for the free speech panel with Yaron Brook, uh, Sutiam Godarzi, Toby Young, and our chair is Sophie Sandor. Too bad. I've never shared anything before. Terrible. Uh, you tend not to speak. Uh, you tend not to speak. A lot of people look after because he's a great woman.